Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview of how I configured this table to use embedded views. And I'll show you how I'm using those embedded views to update the underlying data in my database. So to get started here, we're looking at some equipment data. That's coming in on this named query binding on the data property of my table. If I scroll down a little bit, there's this columns property. Inside of there, I have a column object for each of the columns in my data set. And on the columns that I want to be embedded views, I have changed this render property to view, and I've given the view path property a path to the embedded view that I want to use. And then I also have a view parameter that I'm passing into each of my, embed, my embedded views called source, and that is referencing this custom table ID property on my table. I'll show you why that's kind of important in just a little bit, but in a nutshell, I'm associating the embedded views with this table. Okay, I do have slightly different view params on my dropdown components because I also have to pass in a list of those available options for my dropdown. That's what the view params look like when I have a dropdown. And in this way, you can tell each of these dropdowns have a different list of options, right? Let's take a look at what the dropdown component, that embedded view actually looks like. You can see that source and options, those parameters are there, but also I have some parameters for column, row data, row index, and value. And these are parameters that I didn't set up on the table itself, but they get automatically passed into embedded views. And we can confirm that on the Ignition documentation. This page called Table Column Configurations has a lot of great information. About halfway through the page, though, you're going to see this section about embedding a view in a table cell. And then at the very bottom, there's this list of those parameters that get automatically passed into your embedded views. Okay, so we're using column, row, no, column, row data, row index, and value from there. On the dropdown component itself, there's a binding on my value property and on my options property, and those just go back to those parameters that are getting passed in for value and for options. Then on the dropdown, I also have an event. This event is using the on action performed event. It's going to run a script, and the script is building this payload. This payload is using the new value a column parameter, row data parameter, source and index parameters, as well as this action key that's set to update. And then it's just sending this message, system perspective, send message. And it's using the column action ID. That's my message handler ID. And it's using the page scope, and it's going to send this payload. Over on my embedded text field, the incoming parameters look almost the same, but there's Obviously, there's no options parameter. On the text field itself, there's actually no on action performed event for this component. So notice there's that binding back to the uh, value parameter, but also there's a change script on this text property, and that's how I'm sending the message. So this part is what's the same between the text field and the dropdown, but because this is a change script, I want to exclude a couple of conditions. And this first one that checks if the origin is binding, that's important because when your table loads, it's going to pass a whole lot of values into all of the instances of your embedded views. And you don't want all of these text fields to be triggering a change script that sends a message and ultimately updates your database. You don't want that to happen a whole bunch just from loading your table, right? And then the next one is just checking to make sure that this value has actually changed, making sure that the current value dot value is different from the previous value dot value. And then otherwise, it's just going to do the same thing that the dropdown's doing, send that message with that payload. Back on the equipment, this is the final piece of it. There's a message handler on the table itself called column action. And here I'm extracting the keys and values out of that payload. So source, action, row data, row index, and column. Then I'm checking that source, that source parameter, checking to make sure that it's the same 
value as my custom table ID because what you could have multiple tables on the same view that are using embedded views to update data and you don't want to try to handle the message from a different table as you would handle the data from you know this table right you just want to keep the embedded views associated with those tables makes it a lot easier then i'm checking to make sure that this action if it's update then i'm going to proceed by getting my new value my equipment id building out an update query having my arguments running that query and then just refreshing the data property binding on my table so real quick we'll just make sure that this works so i could change server 2 server 3 rack mounted server 3 we'll say it's say it's a printer it's active and my memo 2 and we can change the area as well why not plant 1 okay so now i can refresh this and it looks like it's stuck but just to be sure let's open up workbench so that server 2 there at the bottom if i rerun this see that change to server 3 yep so it took my updates and that's really all there is to it and you should know that using any kind of embedded view is going to have a similar process to this you don't even have to be updating data right you can just be displaying a graph or a picture or something the process for setting up that embedded view is still going to be the exact same and one final thing that i want to point out is that this uh, data is being brought back as a data set right now but even if i brought it back as a json object it's still going to work with the json data structured this way so i could come in here i could change machine 12 back to machine one drilling machine and we'll just leave that set it back to pending rid of the three there if i refresh that go back into workbench there's machine 12 up there if i refresh this now it's machine one all right so that's working i hope that this video was interesting or i hope you found it helpful and if you have questions if you have any ideas for future videos be sure to leave a comment go ahead and like this video and if you'd like to see more like it subscribe to the channel and we'll see you in the next one Bye bye